Welcome to Exploring the Mind, a partnership between the Ann Arbor District Library and the Department of Psychology at the University of Michigan. This month's talk is with Dr. Jill Becker. For past Exploring the Mind videos and lots more content, check out our YouTube channel at aadl.tv. Now I'll hand it off to Dr. Christopher Monk to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much for joining us. So today it's great to have uh, Dr. Jill Becker present some of her really exciting research. Uh, Jill is the Patricia Y. Gurren Collegiate Professor of Psychology here at the University of Michigan. She's also a research professor of psychiatry uh, and also a research professor at the Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience Institute. Uh, she did her undergraduate and master's work at the University of Kansas and then went on to do her PhD uh, at the University of Illinois. So now for over 30 years, uh, the focus of Jill's research has been on the understanding uh, on understanding the brain and biological differences between the sexes, as well as understanding sex, how sex differences relate to drug use. Um, she's received uh, a, many, many grants uh, from NIH, as well as other agencies to, that allowed her to conduct all this research over many years. Um, she's also received an impressive number of awards for her research her mentoring, and uh, very importantly, for her work on promoting women in science. So today's Jill, today's uh, her talk is entitled Sex and the Brain, What Difference Does It Make? Here is Dr. Jill Becker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It is uh, so nice to be here. Thanks to the Ann Arbor Public Library for asking me to be part of this. And thanks to you, Chris, for that nice introduction. I am going to share my screen. So um, for, as Chris mentioned, for a large number of years, a long time, I have been studying sex differences in the brain. And um, it has been something that I think everybody needs to know about. So I'm excited to be able to tell the Ann Arbor community about the work that I've been doing. And I'm going to start by um, telling you how it is that the brains of males and females become different in the first place. And then I will um, talk to you about whether they're hardwired or not. And they're really not hardwired. It is a interaction between genetics and hormones and the environment that all act on the brain to influence neuronal growth and connections. And that means there is a great variety as you go across individuals in terms of how uh, sex differences in the brain are expressed. And so that complicates the work we do, but I hope I will be able to uh, explain some of that to you. And this has an impact on the brain and on behavior of males and females throughout their lifetime. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then I'm going to tell you how this sex difference in the brain and in particular in the neural systems that I've been studying that mediate motivation are important for understanding sex differences in drug taking behavior and addiction. So in the beginning of a placental mammal's development, the, chromo the chromosomal sex is going to determine the gonadal sex. And so if you're a female, you'll get two X chromosomes. And that means the bipotential gonad will become an ovary. So no signal is sent from the chromosomes to the ovary, it just happens. And then the brain develops in a female typical pattern of development in interaction with the environment and other things that um, nutrition, things that are going on in the animal. And eventually the brain, uh, is fully developed. If you're male, then that means you got an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And on that Y chromosome is a little gene called SRY or this sex region specific area of the Y chromosome. And the SRY gene is the testes determining factor. And that makes the bipotential gonad become testes. 
the testes then start making testosterone. And this happens really early. It happens during the second trimester in humans. I study rats. I think they are wonderful creatures. I love them very much. And that happens in rats um, at the end of their gestational um, period, which is around um, a 21, 22 day period of gestation. So around day 18, testosterone is produced by the developing gonad and that testosterone gets into the brain and in the brain it's converted to estradiol. Now I'm gonna say estradiol throughout this lecture and estradiol is the most potent of the hormones that you probably know as estrogens. So estrogens are produced by the ovary and estradiol is the most potent of the estrogens. Now, I just wanna note that in humans, testosterone actively masculinizes the brain as well, but in rodents, it is um, testosterone converted to estradiol. That's the most important hormone. So this slide shows you a picture of the timeline of development in the rodent from early gestation until adulthood. And what you can see here is that in the male, testosterone increases just before birth. And this peak in testosterone is necessary and sufficient for masculinization of the area of the brain that's necessary for reproductive function. So this is the uh, hormone peak that we focused on for the most part and the event um, in terms of sexual differentiation that neuroendocrinologists have focused on because it organizes the areas of the brain necessary for reproductive function that um, are then going to drive the male's typical sexual behavior and female typical sexual behavior in the adult. But they don't actually cause sexual behavior to happen in the little developing embryo or the little baby because they're um, just getting the brain ready so that when you're an adult, it can act in a sex typical pattern of behavior and in response to the hormones produced by the adult. So first you have this early peak in testosterone in males, but not females. And then really nothing happens until puberty. And then at puberty, again, you have the onset of hormone production by the testes in the male, where there's a continuous testosterone production and the onset of the reproductive cycle in the rat, it's called an estrus cycle. In humans, it's called a menstrual cycle. And with that cycle, you have a uh, an ebbing and flowing of estradiol and progesterone. Around the time of puberty, additional permanent changes happen in the brain of both males and females. So during the early period, it was just testosterone causing the brain to become more male-like. At puberty, the female hormones also cause permanent changes in the brains of females undergoing this uh, estrus cycle. So there are two critical periods, the one around birth, and then the one at puberty. And those are causing permanent changes in the brain to happen. In the adult, there are also temporary or acute effects of hormones on brain and behavior. We call those activational effects of hormones. And the most evident one is that the continuous production of testosterone is necessary for male typical sexual behavior that we see in the rodent. And in this case, the it's the mounting behavior that the male rodent shows. And the testosterone is necessary for the male to show that behavior, just as the female's estrous cycle is necessary for the female to show the typical um, reflexive uh, behavior necessary for the male to mount. These hormones are also necessary for things like spermatogenesis to happen and for the female to, be, to get pregnant and to have um, babies. So up until, oh, about 2001, 2002, about 20 years ago, this is really the picture that we 
thought was happening in terms of sex differences in the brain, that all you needed were these hormones around the time of birth during this critical period. Uh, we didn't, you know, thought maybe something going on at puberty, but weren't really sure about that. But it was always this um, chromosomal sex determines gonadal sex, gonadal sex determines uh, phenotypic sex. And we really didn't think genes were doing anything other than determining whether you got testes or ovaries. And then there was this little guy. And this bird is a zebra finch. And Fernando Nadobam, who was a, uh, a, a bird person who studied um, birds in his laboratory at Rockefeller University, he discovered this little guy and he was retiring. So he gave this little guy to Art Arnold at UCLA. And if you look at him, he's really um, quite remarkable. He's called a gynandromorphic zebra finch because he's on one side, looks like a male. So the male has this beautiful cheek patch and this pretty throat latch is striped and he's very handsome to the female finches that don't have a throat latch uh, stripes, don't have a cheek patch. And that's pretty unusual for um, a bird. And so Art thought he was quite amazing and he kept him in his office for many years. He just let him sing. He sang not really a good song at all, but an okay song. And he let him die of natural causes. And after he died, he took his brain and, and looked in the brain and what we know is that the zebra finch male sings because there are sexually dimorphic areas of the brain that only males have that are necessary for song production in the zebra finch. And lo and behold, when he looked in the brain, he saw the male typical areas of the brain on one side and female typical brain areas on the other side in this song control nucleus. And that was pretty shocking to those, those of us who are neuroendocrinologists because we think hormones are produced by, for example, the gonads, a gland released, the hormones are produced and released into the bloodstream. They get into the bloodstream, they go everywhere in the body. And they, they can do that because only cells, neurons, whatever cell type that is, uh, needs to hear about that hormone has receptors for it. Everybody else, all the other cells just let it go by. So if hormones can get everywhere in the brain, that means the hormones can get everywhere in the brain. So it shouldn't be just one side of the brain, right? And that made Art begin to think that genes might be playing an additional role in sexual differentiation. And he went on to demonstrate that in mammals, there are exactly nine genes on the Y chromosome that are expressed in the brain. And those genes actually are quite important for sexual differentiation of particular brain regions that are important for aggressive behavior and um, some other types of behaviors that we hadn't really studied very much. Uh, and, it, and it led to a really critical thinking in terms of the role of genes in um, sexual differentiation of the brain. So it's not just the hormones, it's also genes that are playing a role in sexual differentiation. And so when we think about the brain, we need to think about it not just as the neuroendocrinologists of the past have thought about it with that one event causes masculinization of the areas of the brain necessary for sexual behavior and then the rest of the brain just develops around it and the female is the default. It's actually quite a bit more complicated. I'm not gonna tell you all the details um, and we don't know them all yet because there's a lot of work still to be done. But you have areas of the brain that are masculinized and other areas that are actually demasculinized during the course of development. And we have areas of the brains that are feminized and others that are defeminized. So you really have four possibilities of um, the types of uh, effects that hormones and genes are going to have on the brain during development. So 
you also need to remember that while you have the hormones acting at particular times and probably gene expression happening at particular times, all of the processes that are going on as the individual develops, nutrition, stress, you know, bad things happening, good things happening, you know, it's not just bad events that influence brain development. All of these interact with the brain that is in the process of becoming either masculinized, demasculinized, interact to form the brain that eventually is present in an adult individual. And the brain is just not hardwired. Okay, that means it's flexible. These things can happen during development and it's gonna adapt to those things that, that happen. And that's true for masculinization and feminization as well. So the brain adapts and it's not hardwired to be either masculine or feminine. Now, that makes it a little difficult sometimes to talk about sex differences in the brain. And that's because, I mean, Everybody wants to think that the brain is distributed basically in a bipolar way. Um, and that means, you know, the, you've got pink brains and blue brains and there's very little overlap. But in fact, the differences are much more nuanced than bimodal, um, not bipolar, bimodal. Um, and, and you have, um, uh, you have, at the very uh, end poles of the distribution, you may have uh, the high, very high likelihood of having females in that distribution and males in the other distribution. But for the most part, if you have a particular um, brain or a behavior that tends to be a little different between males and females, you can't tell from the brain or from the um, particular a phenotype or a trait that's being expressed, whether it's males or females. So that the, um, the characteristics of men and women and boys and girls tend to be more similar than they are uh, different. And I'm telling you that sex differences in the brain are important because it's those little differences that are really, really important to understand. So for the most part, the popular press um, have talked about you know, pink brains and blue brains. And what they're really talking about, in, in my opinion, is that there are advantages in certain cognitive functions that you can see if you have a very large number of uh, individuals. So for example, females tend to do better at perceptual speed and accuracy. They do better at uh, visual memory, at verbal fluency, and with fine motor control. While males to have to, tend to have an advantage on tasks that involve spatial rotation of three-dimensional objects, paper folding usually into three-dimensional objects, target accuracy, throwing something through space, and then embedded figures. But these are advantages. And again, you usually need a fairly large number of individuals to see the difference, but it is a statistically significant difference, which means it is an important thing to understand and to be able to know about the population that you're um, speaking about. Now, I've been interested in less cognitive function and more basic functions having to do with motivation for um, some period of time based on early work that I did as a graduate student. And so when I think about sex differences in motivation, I know one of the things people always ask me is why would there be sex differences in motivation? And in, in my opinion, as a neuroendocrinologist by early training, what we know is that during uh, gestation, there is an increase in the hormone estradiol in the mother and in rats and in other species, that increase in estradiol is really important for the brain to be ready to be a mother when the baby is born. 
and at parturition, the estradiol um, prepared brain interacting with oxytocin and dopamine are, are result in the mother infant bond happening very rapidly. And that's been shown in a number of different species. And it's really necessary for this rapid formation of the mother infant bond for the offspring to uh, survive because the mother needs to be able to uh, feed the baby and lactate and um, take care of the baby uh, in most cases. So this rapid formation of the mother infant bond, I believe underlies the sex differences and motivation that we talk about. And I believe some of the sex differences in drug taking behavior that I'm going to tell you about next. So the sex differences in the neural systems that mediate motivation are necessary to engage in reproductive behavior. And they're also important for engaging in um, energy intake in terms of feeding behavior. And so while estradiol increases motivation for a, a, a mate or for um, access to the offspring, it decreases feeding behavior. So um, there's a, a trade-off on regulation of uh, estradiol and feeding behavior. And in, in males, testosterone regulates energy intake and increases the uh, metabolism rate for males. So when we think about sex differences in addiction, we need to start by talking about what is addiction. And it really does mean different things to different people. As a neuroscientist, I think of addiction as being the consequence of certain substances or activities that become compulsive because of their ability to induce activity in the brain in the reward system. And that can cause long-term changes that perpetuate this behavior that's being displayed or the intake of the drug as it becomes more and more compulsive. So I think about the reward system, which is depicted on this image here, which is a human brain cut down the middle. And the dopamine systems are the neurotransmitters I study. They have their cell bodies in the midbrain and they project to forebrain regions, the nucleus accumbens and the striatum. You don't I'm not going to focus on the particular brain regions in this talk, but those are the brain regions that we study. And I'm interested in um, primarily the neurotransmitter changes. Other neuroscientists are interested in neuronal morphology and neural plasticity, um, as well as um, how the reward system is functioning and in interaction with other areas of the brain. I will tell you something about some of the individual differences that we're interested in. So how does sex differences impact how we think about addiction? Now, part of the problem, as I mentioned, I was gonna come back to is that in neuroscience, we tend to think of sex differences as being bimodal because we don't have a lot um, of differences in distribution um, when it comes to male and female rodents. Although we are working on finding ways that we can be no, more nuanced about the distribution of the, of the sexes as well in more basic research. But we're also interested in how the analysis of the influence of gonadal hormones during in the adult affects um, the brain and addiction related brain systems, as well as the behaviors associated with this. So we will um, uh, differentially manipulate ovarian hormones and testicular hormones to look at how that affects uh, drug taking behavior as well. So we are unfortunately, for the most part, going to be looking at the bimodal distribution in rats of uh, males and females, as well as the effects of ovarian and uh, testicular hormones. Now, when you think about addiction, most people say, but I thought men were more likely to become drug addicts. Why are you telling me about females and addiction? And it's true. Actually, when I started working on animal models of sex differences in addiction, the 
percent of, of males who were addiction with were addicted compared to females was about 70% males to 30% females. It's now about 60% men compared to 40% women. And in the high schools, it's 50-50 these days. Uh, boys in high school, uh, there'll be a slight, slightly greater number of boys uh, who use cannabis, but slightly more girls use the stimulant drugs. So it's not the case that um, I think there's going to be a stronger male representation um, for addiction uh, in the in the future. But what we do know is if we look beyond just the demographics of who becomes addicted, what we see is that the time from first exposure to a drug of abuse to chronic drug use is shorter for women than it is for men. And this is true for alcohol, for cocaine, and for heroin. And so people say, well, how do you know? And basically, it's because females present consuming more cocaine, for example, than men do, even though the amount of time they've been using is shorter. And for a long time, I know the ER docs thought that the women weren't telling the truth when they came in and said, oh, I've only been using cocaine for about eight weeks because they were taking such really, really high doses of cocaine, higher doses than they'd ever seen men coming in um, after uh, starting cocaine. And it, it's only been when the ER docs started and uh, treatment centers started really uh, characterizing female drug patterns of female patterns of drug taking more carefully that they saw that in fact women are escalating use much more rapidly than men at least women who are likely to end up needing treatment escalate their use more rapidly and the other aspect of sex differences in addiction that are different is why individuals start taking drugs in the first place. Women self-medicate for anxiety and depression and stress-related events in their life, while men tend to start taking drugs to be part of the group and engaging in risky drug-taking behaviors that are part of the bonding experience. It's not the case that you know, men don't self-medicate for depression or women don't take drugs to be part of the group, but um, throughout uh, a, a wide range of literature, it has been uh, shown that this is the case, that there are these sex differences in uh, reasons for initiating drug use. One of the things that um, really hit home to me about the importance of understanding this difference is that um, I can see this in my rats, okay? And I, I study uh, drug taking behavior in the laboratory rat um, using a self-administration chamber. So here you have a self-administration chamber and this is my lovely rat. And uh, she is, um, she's going to nose poke and, and she's got one nose poke that's gonna give her cocaine and one nose poke that isn't. And when she nose pokes for IV cocaine, then uh, the next time she's gonna nose poke again. And then before you know it, she's uh, self-administering cocaine. And so we give her the opportunity to do this for about an hour or two a day, depending on the experiment. And every day she gets a chance to do this or it's a guy. So we have in this experiment, we have four different groups of animals. We have males who were castrated. That means their testicles were removed. Ouch, I hear some of the guys saying. Then we have animals, males who um, underwent an experiment, just um, an experimental surgery, just like the castrated males, but they didn't have their testes removed. Then we have ovariectomized females. They've had their ovaries removed and ovariectomized females who received estradiol 30 minutes before their chance in this uh, self-administration chamber. And then 
so this is the number of days they are taking. This is the dose of cocaine that they're receiving, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per infusion. And then this is the number of infusions they received per hour. And what you see is that the females who got estradiol, they escalate uh, drug taking so that they've acquired drug taking as quickly as a rat can when our criteria is three consecutive days of taking more than uh, 10 infusions. So they, they acquire as quickly as they can. The ovariectomized females and the, um, uh, the two male groups are still, they're, they're taking a little cocaine, but they haven't acquired a re regular drug taking uh, procedure. As we increase the dose, what you see is that both of the female groups, the ones getting estradiol and the ones getting just control treatment, both of them have now acquired cocaine taking behavior. And the males are um, increasing their cocaine intake, but they haven't uh, acquired yet. At the highest dose of cocaine in uh, the third week, what you see is that all of the groups have acquired cocaine taking very reliably, but even now at this dose of cocaine, the females are taking more cocaine than the males are, and that's a statistically significant difference. So we see that females are acquiring cocaine taking more rapidly and that estradiol is enhancing that effect in the females. So what about estradiol in the males? Lisa Jackson, when she was a graduate student with me, did this experiment where she, she had um, castrated males, again, the intact males um, who just had the surgical control, castrated males that got estradiol, again, the ovariectomized females that got estradiol, and then ovariectomized females. And these are the ovariectomized females who get estradiol. They're up there, they're acquiring self-administration of cocaine very rapidly. This is the same 0.3 mg per kg per infusion, 0.4 and 0.5. And what should be pretty evident at this point is that the estradiol did not enhance cocaine taking in the castrated male group. So they're right in the middle of the pack. So this is another sex difference in that estradiol is not enhancing drug taking in the male group compared to the um, female group. So that, um, and, and we don't see an effect of castration either. So the testicular hormones are not affecting uh, drug taking behavior and estradiol isn't affecting drug taking behavior in the males. This is a sex specific effect. Now, one of the things that we want to do in my lab is try to develop paradigms that can um, parallel or at least um, provide the opportunity for the uh, rats that we're testing to um, display behavior that may be a bit more like um, the human condition. Um, and so we, in this case, we're giving them a choice. And you know, our logic basically was, you know, and I think anyone um, in the current COVID situation can relate to this, you know, you, the, where the reports that alcohol consumption has increased um, with the shutdown. If you were a rat and you were put in to a self-administration chamber and that was your one highlight of the day and you put your nose into a, this hole and you got an injection of cocaine, you'd probably do it again. And so we decided to give our rats a choice this was an experimental paradigm developed by Adam Perry and Crystal Westenbrook. And so the, the rats have a choice between a delicious banana flavored pellet or cocaine. And then we look at whether they continue to prefer the banana flavored pellet or come to choose cocaine. Okay, so at the beginning, um, so this is over about a seven week period of time. What you see is that um, animals who after seven weeks still prefer the, the pellets are in the open circles and animals that prefer the cocaine are in the closed circles. And then the F is for females and the M is for males. And then on one side we have the pellets earned, which is, um, 
And then on the other side is the infusion urns and both of these are available at the same time. And so this is when they get to choose. And what you see is that early on, even the ones who come to prefer cocaine are preferring pellets uh, at week two. And then when we look at week seven, what you see is that you've, the animals have um, assorted into the pellet preferring animals and the cocaine preferring animals. And the cocaine preferring animals don't take much um, sucrose pellets and the pellet preferring animals don't take any cocaine at all. And basically not all of the animals choose cocaine. That's pretty evident, right? Only a subset of them. And it looks like more females choose cocaine than males. And that's true, I'll show you that in a minute. The, um, and so this is something that's been quite robust and we have uh, repeated it on more than one occasion. If we look at the time course over which females choose cocaine, what you see is that they choose cocaine more rapidly and a, about 50% of the females choose cocaine over pellets while the males wait for a longer period of time and they um, fewer percent of them, only about 20% of them choose cocaine over pellets. We then in this experiment also looked in the brains of these animals after they had chosen cocaine. And what we see is that there is a change in the dopamine response to cocaine associated with having chosen cocaine in that there's less dopamine release induced by cocaine. And this was true in both males and females. So we think that the neurochemical response to cocaine and the choice of cocaine is the same for males and females. What's different is the rate at which that change is occurring with it occurring more rapidly in females compared to males. Now, one of the other things that we're interested in is um, stress and how that interacts with being male or female in terms of affecting drug taking behavior. And this slide just is up to show you, um, it's just an example from work from uh, Sherry McKee's lab at Yale, where she's shown that there's an interaction between stress and gender in humans with um, alcohol use disorder and cocaine use disorder. And what she sees is that the more stressful events that have happened in the past year, uh, the greater likelihood that men will be um, uh, diagnosed with alcohol use disorder. And this is even true, greater odds of uh, new alcohol use disorder in women with uh, greater life stress. So in laboratory animals, we model um, stress by looking at prenatal stress and its effects on self-administration behavior. So prenatal stress is stress that happens to the mother while, the, while she's pregnant. And then we look at what happens to her offspring when they're adults. And what we find, this is Mark Thomas's work when he was a graduate student with me. What, we, what Mark found was that prenatal stress enhances cocaine intake in female offspring, but not in in male offspring, but not in females. And so you see here that these are the prenatally stressed males and these are the females. And there's no effect in the females on prenatal stress while the total amount of cocaine intake in the males using the same paradigm that we've just looked at with the 0 0.3, 0 0.4 and 0.5 mg per kg per infusion over three weeks. When we use that same paradigm, the males have become um, uh, more likely uh, to take more cocaine. But we then went on to ask what's going on in the females. And what Mark found was that prenatal stress increased the proportion of females who exhibited the greatest motivation for cocaine. So how do we measure motivation for cocaine in the rat? What we do is we we, we basically ask them to, to work harder for cocaine as they um, get 
one dose. Um, then the next dose, they have to work twice as hard with two nose pokes. And the next nose poke, they have to give six nose pokes and, and so on. So each time they have to work harder and harder, more and more nose pokes just for one dose of uh, cocaine. And when we do that, we see some, some rats, this female worked 600 nose poke for one dose of cocaine. But then she said, that's it. I'm giving up. That was her breaking point. So the, the point at which they don't work anymore is called the breaking point. And what you can see is that the median breaking point for prenatally stressed females is significantly greater. Th and you can see over on B, this is just the mean of it. Um, the, the prenatally stressed females had greater breaking points compared to all other groups. So they were... Um, more likely to work harder to, for cocaine and they exhibited other behavioral indices that are characteristic of uh, addictive like behavior. So one of the other things we've been looking at more recently is the effects of social housing on self-administration behavior. And, and we're using this as an animal model of social support and uh, social support is one thing that has been shown to decrease drug taking in humans. So what uh, Crystal Westenbrook did um, with Adam Perry um, in my lab was show that if you give uh, females, um, so our social support model is the, um, the rat has a friend in their home cage. So they don't go to take drugs with them. They just hang out in the home cage, but they're there when they come back. And so the female has a female friend in her home cage and the males have a male friend in their home cage. And so the, um, and what we see is that isolated females take more cocaine than pair housed females or, or males either isolated or socially housed. Um, and then after the first week, when they've acquired cocaine taking, then we ask them to work for their cocaine by um, demonstrating what their breaking point is. And again, the individually housed animals have higher breaking points than either the socially housed females or either of the male groups. So this is the individually housed females and their breaking point going, is increasing more and more um, over uh, uh, two week periods of time with uh, five tests each week. So that suggests that social support is more important for females than for males, at least for um, cocaine taking behavior. We, we then went on to look at methamphetamine self-administration using the same paradigm, but this time we just used females. And so after the, during week one, they, they learn how to take cocaine and then weeks two to five, they're um, tested on the progressive ratio schedule that asks them what their breaking point is. And these are the individually housed animals during um, week two, three, four, and five. And what you can see is that they are um, working significantly harder for methamphetamine than the animals that have social buddies in their home cages. Then we asked, is there anything we can do? Can we decrease motivation for methamphetamine by giving oxytocin, for example, it's been suggested that oxytocin is important in social support. And perhaps if we gave back the hormone, that would be something that would be beneficial. And so we tested that hypothesis looking here. Again, this, this is the week five data just replotted, but separated out according to whether animals get oxytocin or the control vehicle. And what you see is that if they just get vehicle, they keep um, having the same high breaking points for methamphetamine. They work really hard. They really want that methamphetamine. But if you give them oxytocin, they start showing decreased motivation for oxytocin. And 
This was true for the individually housed animals and for the socially housed animals. Uh, we saw a decrease in motivation um, with oxytocin compared to vehicle. If we look at the individually housed animals and socially housed animals and ask, you know, how are they different? Um, is if we look at their breaking points, what we see is that social housing has actually increased the number of animals who have quite low breaking points, very low breaking points, and decrease the percentage with intermediate breaking points, but they haven't really increased or decreased the guys with high breaking points. And, and so that suggests that what um, social support is doing is actually uh, decreasing motivation among um, the, those with lower uh, breaking points. What is it that oxytocin was doing? When we looked at animals based on whether they had high breaking points, intermediate breaking points, or low breaking points during week five, these are the ones that get vehicle in the solid bars. The open bars are the ones that get oxytocin. Um, so this is before oxytocin, and this is after oxytocin during week six and week seven, what we see, so this is one week of oxytocin and this is the second week. What you see is that oxytocin is decreasing the breaking point for the individuals with really high motivation for methamphetamine and intermediate motivation for methamphetamine, but it's not affecting those who already had low motivation for methamphetamine, which makes sense. Right. And so what oxytocin is doing um, is basically in addition to the effects of social support is uh, decreasing motivation for methamphetamine. So what we're going to be doing in a grant that I received uh, a little while ago is actually asking what's going on in the brains of these animals, what's happening with males, and can we look at what oxytocin is doing versus social support to changes in the, the dopamine systems in, in male and female rats. What we're going to be using is this new electrode which allows us to chronically measure dopamine that's present in the nucleus accumbens and dorsal striatum and we can uh, uh, measure the response to methamphetamine, we can measure their response to oxytocin in these animals. And the electrodes are so tiny, I'm gonna start this video now. What you can see is this is work done in collaboration with Cynthia Chestic and Perez Patal in biomedical engineering. And you can see these are um, cells that are right near the electrode and there's very little damage so that these very fine electrodes allow us to sample what's going on in the um, dopamine terminals adjacent to synapses that are still fully functional. And so we're excited to be finding out what happens to the dopamine system um, with social support and oxytocin. So what I have told you about is um, how sex differences in the brain are important for our understanding about the factors that influence addiction. I've told you how estradiol enhances acquisition and escalation of drug taking in females, but not males. Uh, I've shown you that stress enhances drug taking, but it, males and females are different in that they're affected by stress and in particular by prenatal stress in different ways and that uh, social housing attenuates the motivation for cocaine and methamphetamine in female rats. And this could really be important for thinking about treatment of addiction and men and women and the role of social support in uh, helping to um, individuals who are attempting to stay clean to remain clean, um, or, which is to say abstinent from drug taking behavior. And I've told you that oxytocin can ameliorate the motivation for methamphetamine in females. And we'll be looking at whether this might have a potential for treatment. So I hope what I've told you um, helps you to understand that sex differences in the brain are fundamental to our understanding of what's going on in the brain. 
and that as we understand sex differences and similarities, that this will uh, improve uh, what we know about the brain and the function of the brain in both sexes. So thank you for listening to me. I want to thank, this is the picture of the Becker Lab before COVID, um, when we were um, able to all get together. And I want to point out that there's a wonderful organization called the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences that has um, scientists who study all aspects of brain and body sex differences that I is a really wonderful organization. And thanks to the National Science Foundation, the Nans National Institute on Drug Abuse, and the Office of Research on Women's Health for supporting my research. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jill. Um, so I'll go ahead and maybe ask a few questions if uh, that's all right. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to back up and I know that this work is, um, is incredibly novel and a lot of people have not looked at sex differences because it's so hard and it's a pain. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering if maybe you could just describe for us why so many other investigators have chosen to, to ignore uh, this topic and what the, what the uh, challenges have been? Well, so I think there is the perception that studying females is more difficult than studying males when I've actually published studies to demonstrate that it is not more difficult to study female rodents. And I don't think it's more difficult to study women. Um, you simply need to um, include females and report the data based on uh, their sex and it's a contribution to the, the literature. Uh, females are not more variable than males, even if you don't include the study of the reproductive cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I personally think that you, you get stuck in a paradigm, mm -hmm. which is um, looking at males and assuming that females are going to be more complicated. And so you don't even consider the possibility that they might not be. And right. that has happened, I think, to a great extent um, in the scientific community. Okay, okay, great. It really seems like that is changing. Uh, and so that's, that's wonderful. And yeah, thanks to the work you've done and a few others, that's really great to see that changing. Great. Yeah, and, and I have published a, a number of studies that help people to understand how to study both males and females. And so if you're interested in doing that and you're watching this, yeah, look me up. I'm sure there's some articles there that can help. Yeah. Great. And uh, so the next question I have is about um, tolerance. And so you've been very careful in your language. And so I imagine it may be questionable to talk about tolerance in a rodent and how, and maybe I'm wrong though, um, but maybe if you can either talk about how tolerance might relate to these uh, sex differences you see where the females increase their, uh, their intake of cocaine much more rapidly than males. Is, the, is there data that that relates to an increase in tolerance or is that is that, does one infer that or is there maybe data from humans suggesting that? So, so tolerance is primarily to the side effects of a drug, okay? And what we know is that for many of the drugs of abuse, tolerance tends to habit, habituate over time um, while the, um, the incentive sensitization, incentive motivational effects of these drugs of abuse become greater and greater over time. Um, so tolerance, there is tolerance to the euphoric effects of drugs of abuse to some extent, but that doesn't affect drug taking because the um, incentive value of the drug doesn't diminish. Mm -hmm. um, with repeated use. In fact, it gets greater and greater. Hmm. So it might seem that you're taking more drug because you don't get the same euphoria when in, I, I think that's a construct in the human literature that's not necessarily supported by all of the data these days. Okay. But part, but part of the problem for the escalation of use, the biggest problem for women, in my opinion, is that um, 
the, the side effects of these drugs are also so much greater in women than they are in men. Mm -hmm. So all of the um, cardiovascular effects, the liver effects, when it comes to alcohol use, all of these things are have greater side effects in, in women. And that means uh, they're also more deadly uh, to, to women. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. And, and the last question I have, have to, has to do with the, the, um, the end part of your studies, I thought were particularly fascinating in terms of looking at uh, social support as reducing um, the intake and also um, oxytocin, I mean, both of which are really, really cool to look at. And I just wonder if there's any thought, I know of like in other literatures people have done like uh, in humans looking at um, taking in oxytocin nasally, uh, has anyone looked at either of these interventions or treatments in humans as being a, a way to reduce um, drug use? So um, there are a few studies with oxytocin and alcohol use disorder in humans where with really high um, levels of alcohol consumption in men, it's been shown to reduce alcohol consumption. Um, and but it, to my knowledge, it has not done been done systematically with women, huh. and um, there hasn't been a good dose response study. And so both of those things are really um, necessary in order to to make much headway. But again, you know, because the people want to study men, there are more men who are um, alcoholics, and so they are an easier. Um, at least in alcohol treatment centers. Women um, tend to take alcohol slightly differently in that they tend to be quiet drinkers and so they're less likely to be in treatment programs. Hmm. And, and then with if they have children they have to take care of, it's also harder to get women into treatment programs. Wow. So wow. It's, it's a double-edged sword there with getting and treating women with all kinds of substance use disorders. Right. Yeah. And I remember you saying this for the, um, uh, for women that they, oh, the men and boys take it often engage in, uh, drug use as a social piece. Women do not. And maybe yeah. that would not based on your, your findings with the, with, uh, social support that that might be a, a further, uh, risk factor for them and, and may, uh, yeah. reduce their prognosis later on. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Great. Um, all right. Well, thank thank you so much, Jill.